it is a really big deal, $39 billion roughly MOE. Uh, it's an interesting time to announce a, a very big deal. I want to come back to that. But before we do, let's just start with who is this deal good for? Uh, this transaction is good for everybody, to be honest with you. First of all, it's great for the U.K. Um, it's a big vote of confidence by Liberty Global and Telefonica in that country. It tells them we believe in the market. You know, we've said publicly we're ready to invest 10 billion pounds over the next five years in broadband and 5Gs. And Boris Johnson, of course, has set out some very big ambition and goals for broadband, and we're going to meet those way early. It's great for consumers. I mean, connectivity is vital. This pandemic has proven that more than anything. And uh, we, you know, this transaction and this combination will put consumers first, you know, faster, more reliable, more innovative services. That's what the market needs. And by setting up this national challenger, uh, we're going to make sure that that happens. And then lastly, it's great for our investors, um, you know, for us. This gives us obviously the scale to invest in our core market, the strength to get back to really solid growth and free cash flow growth and synergy, 6.2 billion pounds of synergies that we share in. So it's a win-win. Mike, when you talk about the consumers, obviously, and adding to the competition, you would expect that would also include lower prices. But at the same time, there's going to be so much leverage on this combined company. I think you guys are targeting four or five times as a ratio. Are you going to be able to actually deliver any cost savings for the consumer? Oh, sure. There's no relationship between the balance sheet and what we deliver to consumers. As you know, we run our businesses in Europe at four to five times leverage and have done so for three decades. Uh, the key is generating free cash flow, and we will generate meaningful uh, free cash flow from this combination. We each already generate meaningful free cash flow, so we're producing cash at the end of every year. There's no deficit. There's no, there's no impact whatsoever. We invest, you know, 20 plus percent of our revenue into our networks and our consumers, and innovation and technology every single year. Uh, so uh, I, I don't see any impact between the balance sheet and, and consumers benefiting. And on that investment, Mike, you talked about this £10 billion that the combined company is going to be rolling out into 5G. How, how has the current crisis changed some of the expectations, both about your ability to invest and deploy that capital into 5G, but also perhaps in the way the government are going to be issuing 5G? Do they increase some of the, the cost for Spectrum as a way of clawing back some of the revenue that they're going to need to, uh, to fill the budget hole left by the crisis? Well, listen, everybody, every country is handling it differently. For the most part, the, I think this has been an eye-opener for uh, regulators and government that uh, their broadband providers, their mobile providers are critical and essential infrastructure. So I don't believe there's any uh, body today looking to penalize or in any way make it harder to, to develop um, you know, next-generation infrastructure. Quite the opposite, trying to make it easier, uh, trying to ensure that companies have you know, the resources and the, and, and the spectrum they need to deliver even better, faster, more reliable services. So Easier, but potentially um, more expensive, right? Well, I'm not so sure. I mean, generally speaking, if you look at the price of broadband uh, today versus what you were getting 10, 15, 20 years ago or even five years ago, you know, we're offering on average in the U.K. 150 megabits per second is the average speed that our customers are paying for and getting today for, you know, ARPUs that are not meaningfully higher than they were when they were getting 5 megabit or 10 megabit. So the price per megabit has come down materially, and the quality of services have only gotten better. Um, I see that trend continuing because it has to continue. It's a competitive market. We're going to compete with BT, Vodafone, Sky. Uh, then this combination needs to be put customers first, and you don't do that generally unless you're, you know, you're, you're, you know pricing is a big part of that. So. And, Mike, I, I, I want to talk about BT because, obviously, as you say, this does put you much more in line with competition against them because you are going to be now this combined sort of mobile and broadband operator. Philip Janssen said last week that they were going to be actually cutting the dividend for a period of time because of some of the headwinds created by the COVID crisis. Um, are you going to face similar headwinds? And if so, what do you do to, to sort of mitigate well, I'm, I can't speak to BT specific, you know, challenges or, or opportunities. It's a great company. Philip's a great CEO. Uh, say that. On the other hand, we we don't pay a dividend today, and this JV will have a 50/50 ownership structure, and it won't be publicly traded. So we don't have the legacy uh, headwinds, if you will, of our capital structure or our or a dividend. Um, we also, I think, are very nimble. You know, we've been able to build networks right through the crisis. As an essential service, we have crews in the streets extending our one-gig platform, pushing broadband out to other, other communities. 
And um, so I think for the most part, we, we, it, I'm not going to say business as usual, but the headwinds for us are very different. Uh, competition is a headwind for sure. There are some very specific things, you know, that we pay taxes on and things like that in the U.K. on our networks. But I would say the organic headwinds we think are manageable here. And the, the sort of, uh, if you like, uh, hot initialism at the moment is FMC, which is fixed mobile consumers and uh, or convergence, sorry, and, and what we used to just call convergence, which was, you know, the industry branching out in different directions. I think last time you and I spoke about the topic, it was all about content, some of the big media companies getting more into content. Can we expect the same sort of thing from Virgin now that it's obviously branched out into the mobile space as well? Well, let me first say that fixed mobile convergence is not a, not a fad in Europe. It is very much the direction of the entire telecoms landscape. This is a fifth transaction that we've put forward where we're combining a, a, a leading broadband provider with a leading mobile provider. It's happened in Holland and Belgium, Vodafone in Germany. Uh, this is very much where Europe is headed, and for good reasons, because customers want to buy services from one provider, um, and it works. We know that in Holland, for example, customer loyalty goes up, churn goes down. Uh, we're able to get almost 40 to 50 percent of our customers on one package of fixed and mobile services. It's all about connectivity, and consumers are smart, and they know that if they can get their connectivity from one provider, that, that matters. Now, in terms of content, in some instances, we've branched into content. In Holland, we own a great sports uh, network. In Belgium, we now own a broadcasting platform. So we have combined content in, I would say, very opportunistic and selective ways. Um, but I think it begins with connectivity. And the content piece, you know, in, in the U.K. specifically, as you would know, we don't feel like uh, owning all of the content is so important. What we feel like is providing all of the content is important. So we're an aggregator of the best content in that country. There's, you can get everything on Virgin. You can get BT Sports, Sky Sports. You can get all the great movies and, and, and programs. We, you can get Netflix. You can get Amazon. So we're an aggregator of the best content. And that is a terrific benefit to consumers. One place for everything. And, Mike, in terms of the, the, the sort of parent company, if you like, Liberty Global, obviously, you still have a lot of money to spend. There is still somewhere in the region of $10 billion sitting there that you can deploy. Uh, any idea where you're going to focus that? Presumably, you're now maxed out in the U.K. in terms of, uh, of near-term deal-making. Well, listen, I would just say what we have uh, always say is we're going to be careful and disciplined about our capital. Um, nobody could have predicted this situation, but we feel very fortunate to have the capital we have. Um, and what we'll look first at our core markets. You know, we're in seven European countries. We want to be sure that every one of those is becoming a national champion. It matters to be a national champion in these markets for fixed and mobile convergence. That is the story, and we intend to pursue that wherever we can in our core markets. Um, you know, our capital structure has always been driven in, to some extent on buybacks, and we continue to look at that as a way of driving capital and shareholder returns. And then we'll look at new opportunities uh, that fit the capabilities that we have as a management team. We've been doing this for 30 years. 